Hello and welcome to your online lecture for the anatomy of the knee and by the knee joint what I'm referring to is the tibial femoral joint uh, and I'm not referring to the patella femoral joint. So we will have two separate anatomy videos to watch. We will have the anatomy of the knee joint or the tibial femoral joint and then there will be a separate online lecture for the anatomy of the patella femoral joint. So if it seems like I skipped through patella femoral, it's okay because we're going to get that in its own separate lecture. I happen to treat the joints separately because they are completely different structures. The tibial femoral joint represents the articulation between the tibia and the femur, right? And then the patella femoral joint represents the relationship of the patella with the femur. And so they're different in the way that they behave arthrokinematically, right? Okay, so let's start with the video. Um, and in this video, what we're going to see is a dislocated patella, right? The problem is, is how long does it take for someone to recognize that this athlete is down on the ground and actually needs help, right? Now, simple extension of the knee probably would solve the athlete's problem, but there's an inherent reality in this as athletic trainers. If you're learning nothing from this video is that we should always be observative of our student athletes, right? We're about 10 seconds into the injury and yet that athlete doesn't have help quite yet. Now, when we look at how the athlete or the patient actually injured him or herself, we can certainly see that it's a non-contact injury, right? Which brings up the other point of this lecture. A lot of the knee injuries that happen within the actual tibial femoral joint will be non-contact injuries. In other words, no one will be around the student athlete when this injury actually happens. Typically, it's a landing mechanism, but in this case, it's a pivoting cutting kind of mechanism. So we have to make sure that we are always observing uh, our student athletes when they're on the field or on the court or in practice or competition. So unlike the ankle joint, which we know that the ankle joint is one of the most commonly reported uh, injuries across all sports in the United States, when we look at the ankle epidi or the knee epidemiology, uh, what we know is that among college, professional, high school sports or youth sports, we know that the knee is the most common injury that you will encounter in the high school setting. So if you are an aspiring high school athletic trainer, most often what you're going to see come into your clinic most often are going to be knee pathologies. I've listed in order the most common types of knee injuries that occur um, at the high school level. And then this again is, is reported by the United States statistics. Uh, so this is an evidence-based statistic. So the most common injury reported among high school student athletes is going to be the MCL or medial collateral ligament, followed secondarily by the patella um, or patellar tendon or tendonitis, tendonitis. And then look at what we get next. Uh, the third type of pathology that reports to the clinic is going to be ACLs. So we can see that ACLs, even though they get a lot of notoriety, although they're way newsworthy, right? So-and-so in, in the NFL just returned, what, two weeks ago? What happened? We had three or four ACL injuries in the first week of returning to play, right? So it gets a lot of notoriety, but we can see that it's probably not the most common knee pathology that we're actually going to interact with or see. Granted, it is one of the injuries that will take a longer time and take up chunks of our times as athletic trainers as we rehab them. Uh, we also know, I'm assuming you all know, that girls are most likely to injure their ACL when compared to their male counterparts. And there is a ton of research to suggest several different factors, both intrinsically and extrinsically. So uh, extrinsically, the, the link or rise in ACL injuries when compared to their male counterparts Females have weaker hamstrings. Females tend to land in, in genu valgus, right? And then intrinsically, what we know about females is that uh, during menstruation in particular, there's increase in laxity, which increases their risk of ACL injury. So we have two different things. We have this increase in, in, in knee injuries among high school athletes, but then we also know just in general across sports, across levels of sports, that girls or females are more um, apt to injure their ACL when we compare them to their male counterparts. So let's take a look at this video. Wow, so if we could look at that and we could call that, what mechanism of injury do you think is happening right here? What's that mechanism of injury? I hope that you all said a genuverus, right? I'm hoping that's what you all said. Uh, so let's play it one more time right here. 
genuvarous injury, which means the LCL is going to be injured, right? So quick, so subtle. Those of you working football, those of you that will go on to work football, something so quick that happened in less than a second's time, right? You're going to have to be able to figure out what the mechanism of injury was because that was so quick. We hope that his athletic trainers were looking at him, but if not, they would have to figure that out. They would do a very stress test, right? All right, let's move on to anatomy. Now that we've talked about epidemiology and um, the risk of injury to the knee joint in specific uh, populations, now we're diving deep into the anatomy. And I really hope that this is a, a true review for all of you guys. There are two anatomical structures that we're going to talk about today as it relates to the knee joint itself. Now in the upper right hand corner, we have the top part of the femur and we really won't talk about that until we get to the hip. So just disregard it. Well then the, the most important, one of the most important anatomical structures to the tibial femoral joint is the distal portion of the femur. So to orient your, you guys, this is the lateral epicondyle. We have the medial epicondyle. And then uh, right here we have the adductor tubercle and it is the distal attachment site to all of our adductor muscles, right? Which will become important in the hip. And then more distally, we have the lateral condyle, which is the largest portion of the femur and the medial condyle, right? And each of these anatomical structures will articulate, right, distally with the, the tibia, right? What we also know at, at the femur in particular is that the epicondyles on each side serve as proximal attachment sites for our collateral ligaments, right? So that lateral collateral ligament is going to attach to the lateral epicondyle that um, medial collateral ligament is going to attach proximally to the medial epicondyle, right? And so they be serve as important attachment sites for the major ligamentous stabilizers of the actual knee itself. Distally, we know that the condyles, like I said, are the largest, roundest portion of the distal portion of the femur. And their major role is kind of twofold. It's to articulate with the tibia, right? Um, uh, by uh, moving or gliding or rolling across those menisci. But then last but definitely not least, what we know about the condyles is that they are rich or covered in hyaline cartilage. And so major component here is anytime there's a tear or a break to that hyaline cartilage, then we expose the bone and we increase the risk of developing osteoarthritis in that knee. So again, those condyles, major role is to articulate with the tibia to cre create knee movement, osteokinematic movement. But then they also house are covered in this thick hyaline cartilage. And that hyaline cartilage, the job of that hyaline cartilage is to protect the femur, the actual femur, the bone itself from injury. As we move to, to the tibia, uh, we can kind of see a beautiful picture of the tibial um, femoral joint here. So we can see that tibial femoral joint here. And one of the questions that I always get asked is, hey, Dr. Cosby, is the fibula a part of the tibial femoral joint? And the correct answer is no, because what we know about the fibula is that it does not in any way articulate with the femur directly, right? Indirectly, we know that the LCL has a distal attachment to that fibular head. And, and so indirectly, is there some relationship to the femur? Yes. But is there a direct articulation where the femur is um, articulating with the fibula? The answer is no, guys. So we have to keep that in mind. So when we're talking about the tibial femoral joint, what we're really talking about are these two, two bones here. And to me, that makes perfect sense. What we know about the femur is it's the largest bone in the body. And then what we know about the tibia is it's the largest bone in the, the lower limb, right? And so those two bones, the femur and the tibula, tibia, articulate, right? Uh, and when they articulate uh, and when they move arthrokinematically, they produce gross movements about the knee or osteokinematic motions at the knee. And those osteokinematic motions at the knee are knee flexion, their knee extension, and internal external rotation. Now, some some may say uh, Dr. Cosby is uh, valgus and varus in osteokinematic motion. I would argue that you some could say that it is a subtle um, osteokinematic motion for sure. But the four that occur at the knee are knee uh, knee extension and flexion, and then tibial internal external rotation are the major osteokinematic motions that are going to occur at the uh, tibial femoral joint. Now, as we look at the anatomy of the tibial uh, femoral joint, the patella again rests and articulate with the femur. So we're gonna talk about it in its own online lecture. So we're gonna ignore that for now. 
and we need to think about the most important anatomical landmarks on the tibia. The first one is the tibial tuberosity, which is the most anterior uh, superior portion of the tibia. Its major attachment uh, anatomical structure is going to be uh, via the what? Good, the patellar ligament, right? That patellar ligament is going to have a distal attachment to the tibial tuberosity. And then we have medial um, and lateral tibial plateaus. Now on the medial side, uh, we know that the, um, the sergeant muscles attach right here, right? So that sartorius, that semitendinosus, and that gracilis are all going to come down and attach on that medial, right? That medial tibial plateau. And then last but not least is Gertie's tubercle. And I like to look at Gertie's tubercle on this anatomical specimen. The IT band has a distal attachment to the actual tibia itself, and that is called Gertie's tubercle. And it sits right here, and you can't see that, right? That's way unsatisfactory. But if we look down here at the knee joint, um, what we'll see is that IT band comes down to attach onto the anterior lateral portion of the tibia um, on an anatomical structure called Gertie's tubercle. So it, Gertie's tubercle receives that distal attachment of the iliotibial band, right? So bony wise, we have the tibial tuberosity, certainly have the patella, we have the uh, medial plateau, tibial plateau, and the lateral tibial plateau. On the medial side, we have the sergeant muscles distally coming down to attach there. So we have sartorius, we have gracilis, and we have semitendinosus coming down. And in lab, I'm assuming that you saw that it creates the goose's foot or the three different um, attachment sites. As we move forward, now we begin to talk about um, the muscles of, of the thigh and the knee. Um, and so anteriorly, we know what we have there. We have the, the quadriceps muscles, right? And in whole, if we wanted to look at the quadriceps, we could the vastus lateralis, the rectus femoris, and the vastus medialis. And as a whole, concentrically, they're going to contract to cause what? Knee extension, right? Uh, and then in addition to the anterior quad muscles, uh, we also have the sartorius, which comes down or arises proximally off of that anterior superior iliac spine, right? It comes down and has an attachment on to that, what, the medial tibial um, plateau. So we have um, the four quad muscles, which I didn't talk about the vastus intermedius because it's deep, right? Super deep to the rectus fem. So if we're orienting ourselves here, that rectus fem has been transected and reflected back. And now we can see the vastus intermedius, right? All four of the quad muscles come down uh, proximally or come down from a proximal orientation to a distal orientation. And by way of the quadriceps tendon, right? have a superior attachment to the superior pole of the patella, right? But as a whole, the anterior muscles of the knee concentrically contract to control knee extension. And then they are going to slow down the rate at which we would flex the knee or slow down um, knee flexion. On the posterior aspect of the knee, we have the hamstring muscle group. I hope you guys all know these by now. But on the uh, lateral side of the knee joint, we have the, the biceps femoris. Um, and remember, I hope in gross anatomy, you saw that there was a long head, which had an attachment to the ischial tuberosity. But then we also had a short head, right, which had a direct attachment to the femur. So we have the biceps fem, which proximally has an attachment to the ischial tuberosity and then comes down distally to attach to the fibular head. And then on the medial side, we have the muscles of the semitendinosus and membranosus. And the way that we can tell which is which is by looking at the long tendon, right? So this is going to be our semitendinosus. And then we have the semimembranosus here. Uh, the, all three of those muscles, biceps, femoris, long head, and the semis all come up and attach proximally to the, what? The ischial tuberosity. And then distally, like I said, that biceps fem is going to come down and have an attachment to the fibular head semitendinosus is going to come down and have an attachment to the medial tibial flare, right? Um, and so these muscles together concentrically contract to do what? Hopefully you all say concentrically contract to um, create knee flexion, and then they slow down the rate at which the move is the knee is going to move into knee extension. Now, the pes and serine, as you guys know it, or I call it the, the sergeant muscles, remember they're all going to attach to that medial tibial flare, so they're going to attach right here. And I love to kind of look at them as, as a group. 
Well, we know about them, so we let's just practice this. So we have sartorius tendon, we have the gracilis tendon, and then we have the tendon of the the semitendinosus all coming down to have that medial attachment to the medial tibial plateau. And we can see this down here. This was a, a dissection that I did with a student. You can actually see them on a cadaver and they are just beautiful, right? They are independent tendons um, as they come off of their attachment sites proximally. But essentially, once they attach to that medial tibial plateau, they become kind of one tendon structure. And remember, just deep to those tendons, there's a bursa. So we have a peasant serene bursa because of the friction that occurs across these tendons and the medial tibial um, plateau. So what we know about the peasant serene is that when the foot is planted on the ground, you ready for that? The pes and serene is going to basically externally rotate the femur on a fixed tibia, okay? So if you could stand up and do that and imagine that, right? So if I'm standing up, which I'm actually doing right now, and my foot is on the ground, when I go to externally rotate the femur on that fixed tibia, the pes and serene is driving that, right? When, however, I am sitting on a table and my foot is suspended in the air, the peasant serene is going to pull the tibia into internal rotation. It makes sense, right? If you're thinking about that, essentially it's going to do the opposite um, of what it did on the ground itself, okay? So practice that, stand up, because it becomes important for us to understand this as we progress to the next slide, which is the screw home mechanism. So the screw home mechanism is an important concept for all knee injuries, in particular the ACL. So the screw home mechanism represents the point at which the medial and lateral condyles are locked in a closed packed position on the knee. So let's think about this um, from an arthrokinematic perspective. Remember, we define arthrokinematics as small movements between two bones which create what? Osteokinematic motion or gross mo movement, right? So in this particular case, what we are saying is as the femur moves on the tibia in a closed kinetic chain, right? Because the femur is moving on the tibia, which means the tibia is stationary. It represents the point at which that knee is going to be locked in a full extension, right? In other words, it represents the point at which the, the medial and lateral condyles are locked on that tibia in a knee extended position, right? Now, can this happen in the open kinetic chain? Heck yes, right? It represents the point at which the tibial condyles are locked, right? Think about that. The tibia is moving, getting into extension. So now it's locked on, on the femur. So we can look at it both ways, but I really like to look at the screw home mechanism from a closed kinetic chain position because that's most often where knee injuries are going to happen. So I'm going to define it one more time. The screw hole mechanism represents the point in time in which the medial and lateral condyles are locked in a closed position on the tibia. The PowerPoint says knee joint because that's what your textbook says, but on the tibia, right? So let's think about that. If you are standing right now, do it with me, guys. If you are standing right now, bend your knee just a little bit and then move into extension. Now imagine as you're moving into extension, that femur, right? Those condyles are rolling over the tibia in such a way until they get to a knee lock position. Now the screw hole mechanism is extremely important and here's why. There are several reasons, but the major reason is because what we see a lot in knee injuries, most of you, some of you have had knee injuries in this group, is that one of the things that gets lost after a knee injury is their ability to get into a knee extended or a knee lock position following surgery, right? Now think about it from this perspective. The screw home mechanism represents the ability of that femur in a closed kinetic chain to lock into position on the tibia. If I have a knee injury, and I can't get into full extension, can I can I maximize my screw home mechanism? The answer is no. So it's one of the reasons as clinicians, we try our best to get our patients full knee extension. The other part that we're not talking about here with the screw home mechanism 
is just as important as it is for us to get into full extension, the screw home mechanism also represents our ability to unlock the knee joint, to move from an extended position, move those condyles from a locked position to an unlocked position to allow our knee to flex, right? So we have two key components. We have the locking mechanism of the screw home mechanism, and but then we also have the unlocking mechanism, the ability to move from an extended position to a knee flex position. Now I've been talking a whole bunch and I think that you guys probably wanna see what that actually looks like, right? So I'm gonna show you a YouTube video because I think they do it better than I could ever do it. You guys, uh, this group did it so well that I don't think it can be redone. What we are going to look at now is this, what happens in the screw home mechanism when we are in a standing position. So this bone right here is going to be femur. This bone right here is going to be tibia. And look at what happens in the screw home mechanism. So when the knee is extended, do you see that? The femur rotates medially to lock. To unlock it, it's going to rotate externally. Let's see it one more time. As I move into a knee extended position, femur there, it rotates medially. Do you see that? To get the knee in a lock position. To unlock, I now have to externally rotate. You see it? And then the knee opens up in knee flexion. Let me say that one more time. In a closed kinetic chain position, arthrokinematically, to move from a knee flex position to a knee extended position, that femur rolls, rolls, rolls on the tibia, and when we get to end range extension, will internally rotate. If I wanna unlock my knee joint and move into flexion, that femur is going to externally rotate or spin externally on the tibia and then start to roll or glide back. Now let's take a look at this screw home mechanism, still closed kinetic chain from an anterior view. I think it'll help as well. So here we are moving into extension. I'm going to medially rotate that femur, externally rotate to open it up, right? Once again, I'm moving into extension, internally rotate to lock, see it? Unlock, externally rotate, and now the knee flex. Take a look at this from an open kinetic chain perspective and know that the tibia is now going to be moving. So when we move into extension, the tibia is going to externally rotate and then internally rotate to open up the knee. So opposite that of femur. Extension, externally rotate to lock the knee. Moving into flexion, unlocking, internally rotate to unlock the knee. So you all can see that this is a complex movement, right? You have to consider whether or not the patient is in the closed kinetic chain, if they're in the open kinetic chain. I think how I wanna kind of finish the screw home mechanism is just to say that it is a critical mechanism that plays an important kind of role in terminal knee extension, the, the, the knee's ability to get into a their most its most stable position, right? Uh, and so that becomes an important concept. When we think about the knee joint in general, we know that it's a hinge joint, right? Where most of the movement that occurs across the knee joint is going to be knee flexion and extension. So you can see how the screw home mechanism, the ability to get into full extension, the ability to unlock and get into knee flexion is extremely important um, kinematic phenomenon um, of the knee joint, right? Finally, I want to talk about the unlocking of the knee because it's the unlocking of the knee that probably is most important with the screw home mechanism. So let's talk about uh, a muscle you guys, I think, know a little well, which is the popliteus. So what we know about the, the popliteus, uh, in essence, is that it has the proximal attachment to the lateral condyle of the femur, right? And then it comes down and has has an attachment to, to the tibia, right? And what we also know about the popliteus, which is extremely important, is that in the open kinetic chain, it's what's responsible for unlocking the knee joint. Does that make sense, guys? It's what's responsible, you're tracking, for causing the tibia to rotate to unlock the knee or move the knee into a knee flex position. Likewise, in a closed kinetic chain, it's our external rotators at the hip that are going to be responsible for the unlocking or the 
external rotation of the femur to unlock the knee to move it into knee flexion, right? I've spent a lot of time here on the screw hole mechanism, so I'm hoping that you're understanding that it's an extremely important mechanism for, for the knee, right? Its major role is to make sure that knee gets into terminal extension, right? That, that knee joint is extremely stable, right? And so we have to make sure that we maximize that, that we get full knee extension. Regarding the popliteus, it is a major unlocker of the knee. When the knee is in an open kinetic chain, it's a major unlocker of the knee um, specifically, right? If we're thinking about that as the knee is in full extension and we need to move it into a knee flex position. Okay, so moving on, let's talk about the ligamentous support of the knee because that's basically what it's, it's known for. Uh, in general, we know that the knee is a joint capsule. So the knee by the knee, I'm talking about the femur and its articulation to the tibia. We know that it's a joint capsule. And so what we know about this is that uh, this joint capsule, uh, this capsular structure kind of envelops all of the knee joint itself. We also know that the knee is a synovial capsule. So in other words, it's surrounded by lots of articular structures. It's surrounded by lots of fluid that, that is allowed to sit in the knee joint and kind of cause joint nutrition, right? So we have the joint capsule, which would represent the articulation between the femur and the tibia, right? A joint is where two bones come together. But then we also have this synovial capsule, this idea or this concept that there's a lot of fluid in the, the actual joint capsule, which creates joint nutrition um, about the actual knee joint itself. And then we have these things called plica. Um, they're extremely rare as you get older. Most often they'll get absorbed by the body, but we have plica in the knee. The, the plica in the knee, as you can see here, are located within the actual uh, synovial uh, membrane of the knee. But the probably the most important plica of the knee is the medial patellar plica. It's the one that we see most often cause a lot of medial patellofemoral knee pain. So we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to those pathologies. But essentially, it's it's soft, it's pliant, um, and what we know happens is that it's going to snap over. Do you see that? The lateral and medial condyles, and so it can cause uh, inflammation, it can cause irritation about the knee joint. But these again just provide more stability to the actual knee joint it, itself. The iliotibial band gets its own slide for many different reasons. Uh, I happen to think that it's one of the most important anatomical structures to knee stability and to hip function, but we'll get to hip function later. The iliotibial band, as we know distally, is an extension of the tensor fasciolata proximally, right? So proximally, we have the tensor fasciolata, which is extremely muscular in nature. And then essentially, as we progress more distally, it becomes the iliotibial band. And we, if you were in lab and you saw the, the images, then you know that the iliotibial band track, which you can see here, is a dense tissue-like structure that is extremely tough, right? One of the things that I've been learning about as I continue to teach gross anatomy is that the deep fibers of the IT band attach to the joint capsule itself of the knee, right? Um, and so this is kind of a cool thing to think about. It attaches to the joint capsule of the knee. And so it in and of itself provides stump, some stability to the knee joint, which is, I think is awesome, right? In other words, it's going to play a significant role in knee stability. It becomes important then to make sure that when a patient has IT band syndrome, for example, that we also check the integrity or the stability of the knee joint as well because the IT band does play a major role in providing stability to the knee joint. What we also know about the knee joint is this. So when the limb is in full extension, so we see that here, what we know is that the IT band is then considered a knee extensor. So in other words, if I'm fully extended, that IT band is also contributing to knee extension. The cool thing about the IT band is that remember, it moves or glides over that, that epicondyle, that lateral epicondyle of the knee. So when the knee is actually flexed past 30 degrees, it becomes, guess what? An assister in knee flexion. So we have this kind of multifunctional muscle or tendon working at the knee to provide stability. 
when the knee's in extension to help with knee extension, when the knee's in at least 30 degrees of knee flexion, it's assisting with flexion, right? So it tells you just how important um, the IT band is when we're talking about knee anatomy, right? We have to give it a little bit more credit than we have in the past. Okay, so now we get to the tibial femoral joints and um, we'll, we'll, we'll talk specifically about really ligamentous structures. So the first ligamentous structure that we have is the medial collateral ligament. So we can see that here. We can see its most superficial layer of the, the MCL. What we know about the MCL um, is that it's broken down into two layers. You can see those there, the deep layer and the superficial layer. Superficial layer is just that, it's the most superficial layer. Uh, superficial layer is gonna have a proximal attachment to that uh, medial epicondyle and then come down onto the medial uh, tibial plateau, right? And we're pretty, we know the medial collateral ligament more than anything for, for its superficial uh, slips. What is most important to us is this deep layer. So you can see the deep layer here. We can also see that the deep layer is attached to the medial meniscus. So it has fibrous attachments to the medial meniscus, right? And to the actual tibia itself. Do you see it there? So when I say that it's attached to the joint capsule, you can kind of see that it has an attachment to the tibial plateau. So it's injury to the MCL. Most often we're, we're assessing the superficial layer, but a lot of times if there's injury to the MCL, we'll probably get some type of joint capsule and or medial meniscal tear. The major role of the medial collateral ligament is to prevent against massive amounts of, of knee valgus forces, right? Because if we don't have this restraint, then we'll injure our ACL, we'll injure our meniscus. So it's the MCL, which is the first line of defense. If there's a massive valgus force at the knee, right? The first thing to go is going to be the MCL. Second thing to go is going to be the deep bundle of the MCL. Third thing to go would be meniscus. And then last but not least is ACL. So we can see how there are these layers of protection on the medial aspect of, of the knee. Next is the lateral collateral ligament. The lateral collateral ligament, unlike the MCL, does not attach to the joint capsule itself or the meniscus. So it does not have attachment to the tibia in any way, shape or form. It doesn't have an attachment to the lateral meniscus. In fact, it doesn't have two bundles. It is just the LCL. We know the LCL attaches to the lateral epicondyle of the femur and then comes down distally to attach to the fibula on the lateral side of the knee. And its major role is to prevent varus, most often in full knee extension, but it can be preventative up to 30 degrees of knee flexion, right? So its major role is to prevent massive varus forces at the knee. We can look at this, we've looked at it in a gross anatomy, a few gross anatomy cadavers, and we've seen that this, this ligament is very, very thin when you compare it to its medial counterpart, the MCL. But the, the awesome thing about uh, varus injuries is that they're rare when you compare them to MCL injuries, right? So if we're thinking about the way that God uniquely makes us and designs us, right? This is an example of this. We don't need as thick of a ligament on the lateral side because we don't have as many various forces. We go back to the MCL. There are tons of blows to the outside of the knee creating valgus force. And so we need a thicker uh, redefined structure. And so we have the MCL, which is a, a thicker structure. So these are things to think about as you um, really truly think about the way that our body is designed. Okay, next we have the anterior cruciate ligament, probably everybody's favorite ligament in the knee, C certainly not mine. It gets a lot of credit, but I think there are other anatomical structures that are just as important within the actual knee joint itself. So we have the um, we have two bundles of the ACL. We have the anterior medial bundle, and then we have the posterior lateral bundle. Um, yes, I did say that the ACL is a two bundle ligament. What we know about this, um, if we're looking at this from a knee perspective, is that it's going to insert on the wall of the the lateral condyle, um, and then have insertions onto um, I call it the intercondylar uh, notch of of the tibia. We know about the ACL, if we're comparing ACL to PCL, is that it's longer than its PCL counterpart. And it makes sense, right? It has to be because it's the ligament in the knee that's going to allow us to rotate as much as we rotate. So it's it's a longer ligamentous structure when we compare it to, guess what? You got it. Yes, when we compare it to our PCL counterpart. 
So what is the role of the ACL in, in the knee joint? Uh, it's fourfold, believe it or not. The first one, the one that we know most often is anter to prevent anterior translation of the tibia on the femur. So that's number one, right? We I think that's the one we know. Uh, it also uh, helps with internal rotation and external rotation of the, of the tibia on the femur. So screw home mechanism. And then believe it or not, it also serves as um, a, a stabilizer against um, hyperextension of the tibial femoral joint, right? So we've got, it prevents massive amounts of anterior translation. It's going to prevent massive amounts of internal external rotation of the tibia. And last but not least, it's going to pre prevent hyperextension at the knee joint, right? So we can see that any injury to the ACL, and now we have increased anterior translation, depending on the bundle that's torn, we could have in increased internal and external rotation. And last but not least, we certainly could have an increase in hyperextension. What am I saying? That's a massively unstable knee joint, right? So this is why the ACL gets much, much notoriety because it plays so many roles in stability of the knee joint. So as I mentioned or I alluded to, there are two bundles to the ACL and I think it's important for us to understand them. Um, so when the knee is fully extended, um, what we know about these bundles is that the posterior lateral bundle is going to be tight, okay? So posterior lateral bundle is going to be the tightest or um, be taut, right? When the knee is fully flexed, what we know about it is that the anterior medial bundle is going to be tightest. And this is the cool thing. As we move into a flex position, you can see how in an extended position, those ligaments are parallel, right? As we flex, what we typically see is as that anterior medial bundle becomes tight in knee flexion, it also does this thing like a wrapping around. Do you see that? So you get a little bit of a ringing of, of the ACL injury or the ACL, which is why we see uh, most injuries occurring in a knee flex position. Number one, that anterior medial bundle is tight, but now not only that, the two ligaments are kind of wrapped or, or wrung around one another. That's what the research tells us anyway. So in a fully extended position, that posterior lateral bundle is extremely tight, but it's the knee flex position where we start to see changes about the ligament. Number one, the anterior medial bundle is tight. Not only is it tight, but we also see the winding or the wrapping mechanism as a result of the tightness or the pulling on that anterior medial bundle. It's why we see so many ACL injuries happen with a knee flexion moment. It's that winding upon of the two ligaments. The brother to the ACL is the posterior cruciate ligament. Interestingly enough, it is 120 to 150% wider than the ACL. So far, so good. Remember, the ACL is longer. The PCL is wider and it's stronger. It's more resilient. Does that make sense? Does this remind you of another relationship, the MCL and the LCL? Yes. Okay, what we know about the PCL is it's, it is the primary resistance, resistant or resistor to posterior displacement of the tibia on the femur. In other words, it's going to prevent the tibia from moving posteriorly, okay? We also know that it assists the ACL um, in restraining the amount of external tibial rotation that a patient can actually go into, right? So here we're looking at the, the PCL. So major restraint in posterior displacement assist the ACL in resisting external tibial rotation. And it is the stronger of the two ligaments by far and the widest of the two ligaments by far. Okay, the menisci, here they are. Uh, there are so many roles of the meniscus. They're listed on this slide, but let me just talk to you about them a little bit. The number one role of the meniscus is to provide shock absorption. So it's bullet point number three. They reduce the amount of forces driving through to the actual femur itself. Um, so they are like, to me, they are like buffers. They are cartilaginous structures, which are comprised of millions of rings. You can't see them, but tiny rings or coils of cartilaginous structures. And so those coils are capable of absorbing the shock and then transferring the shock to, to the femur, right? Or dampening the shock and transferring those forces to, to the femur. The other role that they play in the knee is that they deepen the articulation. In other words, if we didn't have these femur or these menisci, 
I think of them as suction cups. If we don't have them, then we just have a flat, a flat structure of the tibia and a rounded structure of the femur. And so then there's instability there. These menisci literally act as suction cups, kind of pulling that femur into the, the tibial plateau. So they are extremely important in deepening the articulation between the femur and the tibia itself. We also know about them, as you can see here, they improve the lubrication. Um, so in other words, they create like an oil-like substance. Think back to, remember I said that synovial joint where there's fluids within the actual capsule, right? They, they improve the lubrication um, of the articulating surfaces. Those articulating surfaces are the plateau of the tibia um, and the heads of the femurs or the condyle of the, of the femur. They also uh, increase passive joint stability. Again, that's all about that suction, suction cup. And then the cool thing that I love the most is that as we move into extremes of flexion and extension, because they have this cup-like appearance, they prevent extremes um, of flexion and extension. Now, are they the, um, the primary restraint to these movements? Absolutely not, but they are a secondary restraint and extremely important in providing knee stability. And last but not least, they help um, and serve as a proprioceptive organ. So what I mean by that, they are always providing um, feedback to the knee regarding where it is in, in space. So let's talk about them a little bit more. And if I'm spending a lot of time here, then you certainly should know that they are extremely and important anatomical structures. The menisci itself, uh, this should be a repeat. They have a vascular and avascular and a, and a pink zone, right? Um, so what we know is the closer they are to the periphery, the more vascular they are. The more that they move towards away from the periphery, uh, the more we know that they are avascular and they're not receiving a lot of blood flow, right? And so we'll talk about what that means in the longer run. Um, but for now, we'll talk about it as it relates to, to anatomical, um, uh, to, to anatomy, sorry. So on the outside, we have lots of receptors typically coming from the muscles that cross the joint um, and lots of arterial uh, capillary blood flow. And so this outside or the periphery part of the meniscus is going to be fed by those structures. And then again, as we move towards the midline, we there's not there's no muscular structures here, right? So there isn't any secondary capillary arterial venous blood flow. And so there's zero to little blood. There is some research to suggest that in the middle, there's this pink zone. And if it's close enough to the actual red zone that it could feed off of the blood flow, um, and so we have to figure out kind of what, what that looks like as we get to meniscal injuries in just a moment. But these are the vascular zones and you need to know them for your exam. Okay, so speaking of evidence-based practice, um, you are getting ready to enter into, I think, sensitivity and specificity and odds ratios and risk ratios this week. Um, and so this is kind of comes from that kind of literature. What are the risk factors for meniscal tear? So um, acute meniscal tears, what we know is these are the top three. So you're playing soccer or rugby, high incidence of meniscal tears. You've waited longer than 12 months to have an ACL repaired. Um, as a result, remember that ACL prevents external, internal rotation, anterior translation, hyperextension. So because you wait so long, the knee has been able to move and glide more. And so it actually causes wearing down of the menisci. And then those patients that have greater than 25 BMI, and that's weight, right? weight of the femur onto the tibial plateau causes acute injuries to the meniscus. But then we have patients who also have what are called degenerative um, meniscal injuries or pathologies, which means they just happened over time, wasn't an acute injury. Those most often are going to be males. We know about males is they typically are more active, more likely to take risk. And so over time they suffer from degenerative meniscal injuries. Patients over the age of 60, that's just degeneration. So those that work in kneeling and squatting uh, fields would also suffer from that. And those that um, climb a lot of stairs throughout the day are at a higher, higher risk for degenerative. Most often though, unless you're going into physical therapy or physician's assistant school, you're going to see meniscal injuries that are acute in nature. Okay, now this is where we get deeper in this class. So we have the ligament of Risberg, Riceberg, and, and Humphreys. Um, what we know about the ligament, ready, of Risberg. See it there, that little itty bitty guy, okay? So here is the ligament of Risberg. Here is the ligament of, of Humphreys. And then here is the PCL. 
So you can see that these ligaments split intentionally to surround the, the PCL. What we also know about the lateral meniscus is this. Here, let's, let's orient ourselves. So this is the lateral side, okay, of the knee. Here is the cool thing. The ligament of Risberg and Humphreys are what serve as the conduit for the lateral meniscus. Now, why am I saying that? What we see here is that the ligament of Risberg and Humphreys have an attachment to the um, the meniscus. Sorry, I have to orient myself here. To the lateral meniscus, yes? Okay, so what we know about this is the lateral meniscus attaches to the lateral aspect of the medial femoral condyle. How does it do that? How does a lateral structure attach to a medial structure? Medial structure. It does that through the ligament of Risberg and Humphreys. And you can see their attachments here, right? Um, and as they get ready to come up and attach to that medial, that, that lateral aspect of the medial femoral condyle. So the ligament of Risberg and Humphreys are important because they are what attach that lateral meniscus to the medial side of the knee. They are the major stabilizing ligaments, you can see that here, of the lateral meniscus. So they are what's responsible for not allowing the meniscus, the lateral meniscus, to move a crazy amount of time. And then more importantly, what they do is they kind of act as a sling around the PCL. So you can see them bifurcating here to kind of sling around that ACL. And then their, their major role is just like that with the PCL is to do what? It is to um, prevent... Um, posterior translation. In particular, the ligament of Risberg more so than the ligament of Humphreys. In fact, what we know about these, these, this ligament, the ligament of Risberg, is that when we have a PCL injury, it sometimes has been mistaken as a ligament of Risberg Humphreys or ligament of Risberg injury because of where this ligament actually lies, right? So if we think about these ligaments, they're important to stability of the knee, to ensuring that the um, lateral meniscus can move to, to attaching that lateral meniscus to the medial side of the knee and then to providing more support in hyperextension of the knee itself. Then we have this, um, this transverse ligament. The role of the transverse ligament is to connect, guess what, the lateral, the lateral and the medial menisci, right? So its major role is to attach that lateral meniscus to the medial meniscus anteriorly. And if that ligament gets injured, then we can see how the two can move independently, which wouldn't be a good thing. So this is a transverse ligament. Major role is to connect the lateral and the medial menisci. The posterior lateral corner of the knee is extremely important. The posterior lateral corner of the knee uh, most often gets injured in an ACL injury. Um, and here's what we know about the posterior lateral corner of the knee. The posterior lateral corner of the knee provide stability against varus. So not only do we have that small fibular collateral or LCL ligament, but we also now have the posterior lateral corner, which is going to help. It's going to provide stability against massive amounts of external ro tibial rotation. So we have the PCL helping with external tibial rotation, the ACL, and now we have this posterior lateral corner. And it's going to help protect the knee against anterior and posterior forces. So what is the posterior lateral corner and what in the world is contained in the posterior lateral corner? Well, I'm glad you asked. So um, they are all highlighted here in this image, but we have the lateral head of the gastroc. We have the popliteus tendon, the tendon of the popliteus. We have the popliteus muscle. We have the patellofibular ligaments. We have the biceps fem. We have the IT band. And last but definitely not least, we have the LCL. All of these structures make up what is called the posterior lateral corner. And we've talked about all of these structures independently, minus this popliteal fibular ligament. But all of these structures come together to create the posterior lateral corner. And they help prevent against what? The, the, the various forces about the knee. They help prevent against extreme amounts of external tibia rotation. And then last but not least, they work together to prevent massive amounts of forces as it relates to anterior posterior forces about the knee. So this is a, an important structure. Most often when we have an ACL injury, the posterior lateral corner gets injured as well. And we'll talk about injury to this corner and what are the consequences for our patients when we get to injuries of the knee joint itself.
Last but not least are the arcuate, is the arcuate ligament. The arcuate ligament is going to assist the cruciate ligaments in controlling posterior lateral rotary instability. So let's look at the arcuate ligament here. Do you see it there? So here's popliteus to orient yourself. This is the posterior aspect of the knee. So we've got the popliteus and then right here we have the arcuate ligament. So in essence, it's going to assist particularly the posterior cruciate ligament um, in controlling posterior lateral rotary instability. What does that mean? Instability that happens um, from a, a varus injury, instability that happens from the knee gliding too far posterior, right? Its major role, as you can see, is to assist that PCL. So it's going to help prevent posterior translation of the tibia and massive amounts of valgus force at the knee. Um, and so what we know about the arcuate ligament in general is that if there's injury to this ligament, you're going to see increased amounts of external rotation um, of the tibia on the femur, which is a terrible thing to happen at the knee. If we have massive amounts of external rotation, tibial external rotation, then we're at a high risk for osteoarthritis. We're at an increased risk for injury to the ACM. That concludes the anatomy for the tibiofemoral joint. Please let me know if you have any questions.